So the last type of asymptote that we can have is called a slant asymptote. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's going to end up being a diagonal line that the graph will pass through. So before we had either horizontal or vertical ones. Now we have a diagonal line that the graph can't pass through. So before we actually start looking at what slant asymptotes look like, just want to dust off your long division cobwebs. So we're going to divide 6x cubed minus 19x squared plus 16x minus 4 by x minus 2. And when we talked about this the other day, you guys said you remembered synthetic division a little bit. You remembered the big box that it had and stuff. You can use synthetic division for some of these, but there were only specific cases that you could use synthetic division. So I figured just to keep it a little bit simpler for you guys that we'd go with long division because you can use it every single time instead of having to decide first if you can use synthetic division and just adding in extra steps. We keep it as, as clean and simple as possible. No. So here we go. Good try. We're going to take 6x cubed minus 19x squared plus 16x minus 4, and we're going to divide it by x minus 2. So now the first thing you want to make sure is that when you write your function that's inside the division sign, so this one, the big long giant one right here, you want to make sure that you have every single term in there. Remember you had to hold places with zeros if you were missing a specific exponent. So I have a 3, a 2, a 1, and then a 0, so I'm good there. If I was missing a term with a specific exponent, I would just hold it with like 0x squared or 0x so that I had all my spaces filled in all the way across. So then I'm going to look at my x and I'm going to look at the first term in my division, which is 6x cubed, and I'm going to ask myself what do I need to multiply x by in order to get 6x cubed? So first I ask myself, how many more x's do I need in order to get? I need an x squared, right? Because I already have one x. So to get to x cubed, I need two more. So that tells me I at least need an x squared. And I intentionally line that up over my x squared that's inside my division sign. And then I say to myself, OK, I really have a 1 here. And I need it to be a 6. So I need to multiply by 6 in order to change it. So I also want a 6 here. Once I pick what I need to multiply by, then I need to multiply both terms. So I'm going to say 6x squared times x, which gives me 6x cubed. And then I'm going to do 6x squared times negative 2, which gives me negative 12x squared. You okay so far? Is it all coming back to you? Maybe. And then I'm going to subtract those. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to change all my signs to be the opposite because I'm going to subtract them. That way, when I do 6x cubed minus 6x cubed, it completely cancels. And then I do negative 19x squared plus 12x, which gives me negative 7x squared. And I'm going to bring down my positive 16x. So now I need to ask myself, okay, what do I have to multiply x by in order to get negative 
7x squared. I need a negative 7 and I need an x, right? So I'm going to write up here a negative 7x. And now I'm going to do negative 7x times x, which gives me negative 7x squared. And then I'm going to do negative 7x times negative 2, positive 14x. I'm going to subtract them, so that means I'm changing both of their signs. My 7x's cancel out. Goodbye. 16x minus 14x, 2x. Bring down the minus 4. And now say to yourself, what do you have to multiply x by in order to get 2x? Just a 2, right? So I add a 2 up here. Now I do positive 2 times x, which gives me 2x. Then I do positive 2 times negative 2, which gives me negative 4. I'm going to subtract them, so I change their signs. And look at how beautifully that works out. 0, 0, nothing's left. So my answer would be, when I divided this, I got 6x squared minus 7x plus 2. So when we're finding our slant asymptotes, we're going to have to use this long division in order to find the equation of the slant asymptote. So that's why I wanted to make sure we kind of remembered it a little bit before we jumped right into talking about slant, slant asymptote and then broad that up. You ready? All right, so if we're talking about a slant asymptote, we have a slant asymptote when the degree of the numerator is one bigger than the degree of the denominator. So we only have a slant asymptote. It only happens when the degree of the numerator is one bigger than the degree of the denominator. And will it always happen? Yes. Always. Oh, yes. So it always shows up when the degree of the numerator is one bigger than the degree of the denominator. So that, for example, would look something like f of x equals x squared minus x all over x plus 1. So my degree of my numerator is exactly one bigger than my denominator. Would I have a horizontal asymptote in this situation? No, right? Because my degree of my numerator is bigger. My rule for horizontal asymptotes says if the numerator has the bigger degree, there's no horizontal asymptote. So if 
you have a slant asymptote, you won't have a horizontal asymptote. So they never show up at the same time. So your classwork today is going to ask you on the first couple just to decide if they have a horizontal asymptote or a slant asymptote or neither. You can never have a horizontal and a slant at the same time. Because in order to have a slant asymptote, the numerator has to be bigger, has to be one bigger. And if the numerator is one bigger, then you don't have a horizontal. Horizontal is numerator bigger, no horizontal. Denominator bigger, then it's y equals zero. And if they're the same, then it's the leading coefficient. So when you look at a graph, that actually has a slant asymptote, you can kind of notice it because it'll look something like this, where you'll see that you have this like diagonal line that if I was a better drawer would split right in here. So you're going to end up our, the graphs that we saw the last couple of times were more, they were straighter, they kind of flattened out, and you could see that there was a clear like vertical space between them or horizontal space between them. These ones are going to be a little slanty, so it's going to be obvious that they have a slant down. So All right, so the, quit, the, little, uh, the questions that you are going to see today are going to say things like, Find the equation of the slant asymptote for the rational function f of x equals x squared minus x minus 2 all over x minus 1. So in order for you to find the slant asymptote, we're going to divide the function and see what we actually get, and that will be your equation for your slant asymptote. If when you divide it, you end up with a remainder, we don't care about the remainder for the equation of the slant asymptote. We only care about the entire part that goes into the function because the remainder essentially is going to become zero as we get closer and closer to infinity. So we don't have to worry about the remainder if there happens to be some. So like the one we did as an example worked out that we ended up with zero at the end when we subtracted. If when you're subtracting, you end up with like seven or x and there's nothing that you can do to simplify that anymore, it's okay. If you have a remainder, we just ignore it. So we just like yeah, we literally just ignore it because what's happening is when we're talking about an asymptote, we're talking about the ends of the graphs and what's happening to them as they get closer and closer to positive or negative infinity. And if you plug positive or negative infinity into a fraction, you're going to end up basically getting zero because you're going to have one slice out of a whole bunch. And if I took the pizza and I cut it into infinity slices and like gave you one teeny tiny little slice, you're going to be pretty mad at me because it's basically not the same. Now that you're hungry, let's do some long division. All right. So we're going to take the numerator and we're going to divide it by the denominator because that's what a fraction tells us to do. So I'm going to take x squared minus x minus 2 and I'm going to divide it by x minus 1. This will give me the equation of my slant asymptote. So I say to myself, okay, what do I need to multiply x by in order to get x squared? Just an x, right? So x times x gives me x squared. x times negative 1 gives me negative x. Then I have to change my signs. My x squareds cancel out. Negative x plus positive x is zero. Bring down a minus two. Is there anything I can multiply x by in order to get negative two? No, it doesn't have an x in it, right? So this is that situation. That's our remainder, that negative two. We don't care about it. So here, the equation of our slant asymptote is just going to be y equals x because it's only going to be whatever is up here.
you want me to write down steps for solving these or you think you're okay? Do long division. Use your answer as your equation. Let's try one more. A little bit trickier of a division. Find the equation of each asymptote in the function f of x equals 2x cubed minus x squared minus 2x plus 1 all over x squared plus 3x plus 2. So they want to know horizontal, vertical, and slant if they're asking for each possible asymptote. We know if they're asking for asymptotes, the first thing we want to do is look for the horizontal one because we want to look at our unfactored version for our horizontal. So if we want to know horizontal asymptote, if I want to know my horizontal asymptote, I'm looking at my degrees. I have a 3 and a 2. The degree of the numerator is bigger than the degree of the denominator, which means what? There's no horizontal asymptote, right? None. Since top degree is bigger. So our rules for horizontal tell us that since the top has a bigger degree, there is no horizontal asymptote. So now we have options. You want to find the slant next or you want to find the vertical next? You want to find the vertical next? All right. What do we have to do in order to find the vertical asymptote? Yeah, so we've got to factor the numerator. We've got to factor the denominator. We've got to see if anything cancels out. And then whatever doesn't cancel out, we have to set equal to zero. Do you remember how to factor something that looks like that? No. Because there's too many things going on there, right? Yeah. What if I did this? Is that bringing up any memories? Maybe. Maybe kind of. So if you have four terms and you want to factor it, the only thing you possibly could do is factor it by grouping, which may work sometimes and it may not work other times. Because we're not necessarily always going to be able to factor it. We just want to check to see if we can. Because if we can, there might be things we can simplify and get rid of before we start trying to solve. So if we're going to try and factor this, we're going to say, OK. What do I share with 2x cubed and x squared? And x squared. So I'm going to pull the x squared out, which leaves me with 2x minus 1. And then when I factor by grouping, I intentionally want my leftovers inside the parentheses to be the same. So I notice that my other set of parentheses over here is a 2x plus 1. So I'm going to pull out a negative so that I end up with 2x minus 1. Because I have this negative here, I have the opposite of what I need. So if I pull out a negative, I end up with 2x minus 1 right here. Do you want to finish factoring the numerator, the little numerator and then factor the denominator? Or do you want to kind of do them both at the same time? Can you handle doing both of them at the same time? That way you don't have to write as many things. Because now if we want to factor our denominator, that's just our standard trinomial, right? That's saying what multiplies to 2 and adds to 3. 2 and 1. So I have x plus 2 and x plus 1. 
I'm going to keep going with my numerator, my denominator. There's nothing I can do, but my numerator I can still simplify. So now in order to simplify my numerator with my twins like this, I take the outside and I make that one set of parentheses. And then my second set of parentheses is the matching twin. So I end up with x squared minus 1. Because even though this is just a minus sign, I know that the coefficient there is a 1. I just didn't have to write it. And my second set of parentheses is 2x minus 1 because that's what they shared. Is that coming back to you? A little bit. So then my denominator is still just x plus 2, x plus 1. Do you see anything that's the same? Not yet, right? Do you see anything else you could simplify? Yeah. So I agree, x plus 2, the denominator, there's nothing we can do. There, there's not any like terms. There's nothing we can break up more. The numerator, though, has this x squared minus 1. And I can factor that. That's a difference of perfect squares there. I can factor that to be an x plus 1 and an x minus 1. So my numerator really becomes x plus 1, x minus 1, and 2x minus 1 all over x plus 2 and x plus 1. Yeah, so now I see that my x plus 1s cancel out. And it was super important for me to do this because if I hadn't, when I solved for my vertical asymptotes, I would have gotten that x equals negative 1 when I just solved the denominator if I hadn't factored. And it's not, now this is going to go away. This is actually going to cancel out. And it's not going to be a vertical asymptote. So I would have gotten a false answer if I had just skip the factoring step and straight up take the denominator and set it equal to zero. So you always have to make sure you factor first. So now, now that I've exhausted my brain factoring this bad boy, I still have to take the denominator, set it equal to zero. So zero equals x plus two, which thank goodness that's an easy equation to solve. And I get that my vertical asymptote is at x equals negative two. So, so far I know I have no horizontal asymptote. I've got a vertical asymptote at x equals 2. And the last thing I have to find... Uh, if there's no vertical asymptote, that means that the function has a whole limit. I'm going to look at that on Tuesday. Yeah. So now we need to find our slant asymptote. We need to know, we need to do our division. So if we need to divide this, we need to take our equation, our numerator, and divide it by our denominator. So I'm going to take my 2x cubed minus x squared minus 2x plus 1, and I'm going to divide it by x squared plus 3x plus 2. So I'm going to ask myself, what do I need to multiply x squared by in order to get 2x cubed? And I know that I need an x, right, and a 2. And I'm happy because I'm like all the way at the end of that equation, basically, when I pick what I needed to multiply by. So I know there's not going to be too many steps when I go to divide. So I do 2x times x squared, which gives me 2x cubed. 2x times 3x gives me positive. 6x squared and 2x times 2 
be positive 4x. I'm going to change my signs because I'm subtracting. My 2x cubes cancel. Negative x squared minus 6x squared gives me negative 7x squared. Negative 2x minus 4x gives me negative 6x. Bring down the plus 1. And then I ask myself, what do I need? You multiply x squared by in order to get negative 7x squared, just a negative 7. So then I get negative 7x squared, negative 7. Yeah, I mean, pretty much we know that it's we're not going to go any farther. So if you recognize that, you can stop at this point, yeah. 21x minus 14. This is going to cancel. These are positives. And we're no longer going to be able to go anywhere. So our equation for our slant asymptote here is y equals 2x minus 7. which being able to find these is eventually going to lead us to being able to draw the graphs of these functions. Because remember, that's our ultimate goal. That's where we're going next week. So right now, all, all you're going to be asked to do is find the actual equations. Then we're going to have to graph these things next week. Okay.